My hair after applying this uh, shampoo is look like duang <laughs> and he said <laughs> Welcome to Mosaic of China, a podcast about people who are making their mark in China. I'm your host, Oscar Fuchs. Well, a big thanks to everyone who contributed on the WeChat groups about last week's episode with Emily from Sea Life. And a special shout out to Josh from the Mandarin Slang Guide podcast for his contributions. Please check out that podcast if you're interested in learning anything about slang and Mandarin. It is a really great show. As for this week's episode, it's the product of me wanting to find the most diversity as possible for the series. And I remember for a few weeks at the beginning of this year, I'd been using my network to try and find people from the world of banking. And it was the same story about people from the world of artificial intelligence. And at the same time, I was also looking for somebody to represent the Indian community in China. And wouldn't you know it, I found Srinivas Yanamandra, who actually ticks all three boxes. And what makes it all the more special for me is that I was introduced to him by Kiran Ragiredi in Shanghai, who's been a friend of mine since we first met in Tokyo 10 years ago. So a big thanks to Kiran for the initial introduction. This episode is diverse in another way too. It's probably the one which has the biggest contrast in terms of the content. It goes from the cerebral to the silly. Srini went from making me think deeply in one minute to then giggling like a schoolgirl in the next. And just one correction, as part of this conversation we talk about the BRICS countries and we mistakenly say that they have no shared borders, which overlooks the fact that of course China does have a border with Russia and with India. What we meant to say was that they don't have the same geographical proximity as with other groupings like the EU or the ASEAN countries. Well, thank you so much for coming in today. I'm here with um, Srinivas Yanamandra. Srinivas is the Chief of Compliance at the New Development Bank. Hello, guys. And you like to be called Srini, so I think that's probably easier for everyone. <laughs> Srini is okay, perfectly. Thank okay, you. Srini, I will try my best. Let's um, start off by discussing the object that you've brought. So what is the object that in some way describes your life here in China? So the object that I have brought is here with me, the apple. Basically, when I was thinking about uh, what object should I carry, uh, I, I had some instinct in terms of uh, how a uh, human kinds evolution can be described through apples uh, there are three apples which have actually led to three different uh, evolutions in the humanity the first apple of the adam and eve uh, this has led to evolution of instincts and then the second apple which has fallen on isaac newton uh, that has led to the evolution of inquisitiveness and the third apple which we see in our hands day in and day out the iphone and that is the evolution of intelligence. Uh, so I think uh, Apple summarizes uh, the entire humanity since the Big Bang till today into three distinct phases of our evolution. And I think that is what I'm experiencing in China, uh, uh, re-evolving myself and uh, uh, re uh, re uh, rethinking about uh, how we have evolved ourselves. Uh. Wow, well, you've, you've already elevated that question way beyond what, what it was originally intended for. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now in China. See, I work for this uh, multilateral development bank, uh, which is recently established, uh, uh, 2015, and it's called as the New Development Bank. And this is started by the BRICS member countries, uh, the five countries uh, with the acronym Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. I work for this bank as uh, the chief of the compliance division. Uh, since the bank is starting new, we do have a lot of our clients uh, who have to follow certain policies and procedures relating to integrity. So I do take care of some of those aspects relating to compliance in the bank. And the bank itself used to be called BRICS Bank, right? Yeah, people popularly call it as the BRICS Bank, uh, but uh, at some stage in future, it may not necessarily be open to only BRICS countries. So uh, the actual name of the bank is New Development Bank, uh, but it popularly goes by the name BRICS Bank. Got it. And so when did you come along um, to join this bank then? So I joined in 2017. Uh, it's about two and a half years now. I'll be completing uh, the first stipulated term of three years, uh, four months from now. And so having now lived here for almost three years, can you remember when you first arrived? Like, What was the experience of you moving to China in the first place? <laughs> that would be a very crazy experience. Uh, in fact, uh, before I answer, I thought like uh, since I was ta talking to you, I need to na uh, make you know about a brief habit of mine. Uh, I, I, and that habit I would uh, try to paraphrase using a uh, Latin term. Uh, Omnitrium perfectum. I don't know if you have heard about it. It's basically everything that is said 
in threes goes perfect like if you have to talk about the us constitution uh, it says about liberty equality and pursuit of happiness and maybe you heard the term mini vidi vici and our traffic signals uh, which typically it say stop look and proceed so uh, basically uh, i i i have this funny habit and uh, i think it will come out in uh, most of my questions and answers uh, i will try to answer in threes and coming back to your question about uh, 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 what is that really uh, uh, went in my mind at the time of uh, taking a decision to come to china uh, i think i have got uh, uh, three things uh, to bother about uh, the family uh, how do they perceive because uh, we never uh, had an aspiration to work or stay abroad as a family the second one is food yes, and we have got specific restrictions in terms of certain food and about the future so because i was taking a big gamble I was working for a commercial bank and uh, coming to a development bank is in the career of a banker a big change and the second one is I working for uh, private sector so far and now coming to a public sector is a different mindset and then I was working for India and then moving to China so again this is another change so I think the these things are playing in my mind about family food future and the switch overs that I'm just spoken about but the only thing is uh, the excitement uh, uh, what it can bring uh, of the role that has been offered to me the engagement in the topic that i have researched crazily about in terms of regulation compliance and how it is going to help me see life in an international environment and then uh, the education for the kids uh, because there is no better opportunity for the kids to uh, stay and study and intermingle with the multicultural environment like in china so these three uh, the excitement and maybe my engagement and maybe the education component i think these have taken away a three f's that i have got about family food and uh, <laughs> the future nice and so specifically with the bank you know how often in a lifetime do they start a new bank like this so i can i can sort of see why you are interested in in coming yeah in fact that's what uh, 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 whenever anybody asked me uh, i used to question them the same thing uh, uh, did you ever know how it used to look like when the world bank was uh, established and uh, do you know uh, what sort of things have went behind uh, when the imf the international monetary fund has been established uh, so these are the things that uh, doesn't happen uh, every day uh, the last multilateral development bank of this size and scale has probably been established maybe two decades before so not everyone will get a chance to really work on something uh, so phenomenal internationally geopolitically so that opportunity overrides uh, every other concern which uh, probably one can have while taking such kind of decision and it's such an interesting combination of countries where they have the bricks how would you describe the culture uh, and just generally working in, in the ndb the bricks is uh, a conceptualization initially a uh, very early in 2000s uh, an investment fund manager who has coined this term bricks and even the s didn't exist at that time it has started as a brick club for the purpose of making good investment into emerging market economies and then the s south africa got added later in life in terms of i think 2010 or so and uh, while this acronym uh, is basically meant for set another purpose uh, uh, it started to caught on as a representation of the emerging market in developing countries uh, well, we don't have any kind of connections uh, either geographically we are not close to each other we don't share uh, borders uh, there is no uh, connection of uh, languages uh, we speak five different languages and none of them uh, crazily sound differently to each other and also we don't have any kind of cultural uh, root or a commonality uh, that one can expect between two nations uh, so it is like com- completely uh, you can say unknown kind of environment and truly truly multicultural environment so that is going to be a, f- a phenomenal way to think about uh, a multicultural environment especially for one like me who haven't worked in such kind of environments before and when i think about it where you know you described it very well it's these emerging markets it's like a new world order really this is where maybe where people who understand the past world order do they see the brics grouping as a threat of some kind no i think let's turn to the object once again now if you say uh, uh, like when we were kids for example when we are thinking about a for apple that's how we started learning our alphabets uh, so when we start saying a for apple uh, in our minds uh, in our generations at that time the apple is basically this apple 
but now if the kids are learning uh, the same thing a for apple uh, the probability of the image of the physical apple striking them uh, is very low what apple that strikes in their mind is the iphone does that mean this new order of this apple is taking over this old order is it threatening this uh, i don't think so uh, basically this apple is the representative of that generation and this represents the instrumentality of this generation maybe the world bank is a, a representative institution of that generation when the world is in need of some uh, leadership institution to lead the development of financing aspects across countries uh, but brics bank can be considered as an institution of representative of this generation the emerging market economy forces so if you see that way the question of like challenging or taking over or replacing world orders to may not uh, exist as it is like portrayed uh, normally in mainstream and what was the thinking behind having it based here in shanghai and um, was it always the case that it was going to be based here or could it have been based in any of the brics countries it could have been based in any of the brics countries but uh, the infrastructure leadership that this country has uh, is best poised to offer such kind of a facility for the new emerging market economy and uh, uh, that's how the headquarters have got in here and are there any other examples of multilateral organizations based here in shanghai or is this the only one this one is only based in shanghai and we have a you can call it a sister institution uh, which is awib asian infrastructure investment bank we are established at about the same time and both are headquartered in china but one in shanghai and one in beijing oh the aib is in in the beijing in beijing okay well let's zoom in on your particular role then so what is it that you would do day in day out or or maybe broadly like what is your overall objective Uh, so i can describe my role as uh, always toying in between these three things uh, the compliance part and the conduct part and the culture part uh, to what extent uh, you are going to enforce uh, compliance because compliance is always like uh, you have a dictum and you have to enforce the dictum uh, the dictum is given either by self or it is uh, given by the market entities and then there is a conduct uh, a conduct needs to be imbibed uh, with uh, uh, advisory from the uh, compliance division so you have to advise people on the right conduct and then over a period of time you don't need to do anything your culture evolves automatically so this is the toying in that we do uh, in a day in and day out uh, between compliance and conduct assuming that uh, these two things will evolve the organization culture in the long run so then let's let's talk about an example then have you come across any particular examples uh, when it comes to compliance that you've had to get involved in Uh, it's not necessary that uh, uh, i could gather some examples of what my work in ndb is uh, but there is a great amount of learning because of working in ndb uh, that we had an opportunity to observe what sort of developments that are happening in and around uh, but in my role in terms of thinking about compliance and conduct uh, we generally focus upon uh, what you call uh, anti discrimination uh, you focus upon harassment for example uh, and uh, try to ensure that uh, the workplace is uh, free of harassment but that is a a very uh, mundane kind of a, uh, a role that a compliance officer carries uh, but when you zoom into artificial intelligence uh, this same uh, harassment can take into three different forms uh, it's not necessary harassment by individual to individual it could be an harassment by machine to individual uh, so it could be like an algorithm grooming Uh, so when you are watching certain uh, youtube videos and there are certain algorithms and uh, your kid getting groomed by the way and the history of that uh, uh, videos he is getting shown so it could be a kind of a pseudo kind of an harassment that the machine can induce into you when you said the phrase harassment by machine to human like that's why i think oh the people who are running their lives based on the notification from their phone and then as you say like you you have people who are watching a youtube video and then the the algorithm takes them into more and more extreme 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 and then you are actually making people into more ex- extremist thinkers yes and that's a, a machine learnt harassment yes or there could be a harassment which is by person to the machine as well like uh, we can talk about like siri or we can talk about alexa it's not necessarily that when you're talking to siri or alexa that every person is polite and every person talks only uh, uh, things that they want they do harass siri they do harass alexa so that harassment is from person to machine and then we haven't yet seen uh, i think this is going to be the world we are going to enter into shortly a harassment of machine to machine 
So we really don't know when an autonomous vehicle is going to try to talk to, say, for example, an IoT device connected to your home. So what sort of behaviors these machines are going to exhibit to each other? So that is going to be another dynamic challenge that we are going to come to. So a mundane job like a compliance officer and a uh, ethical uh, principles that we talk about, which are like uh, never talked about in uh, openly, are becoming center stage of discussion uh, because when the machines are coming into such kind of uh, prominent roles, uh, how they interact with uh, humans, how you humans perceiving them, and in a short while from now, how machines are going to interact with each other. So that is going to create a new set of challenges for compliance and conduct and uh, uh, even the ethics as well. Mm. That's fascinating and scary <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> but you're talking about it right now in the abstract. Like This is something which you're just interested in and you're studying right now. There's nothing right now that you're seeing, especially in the bank, right? Connect. Okay. Well, that's something to watch out for in the future. <laughs> I think it is not necessary that I would consider as something of future. Uh, people talk when they say about technology and they always say that it is about future. Uh, but uh, uh, to some extent, my uh, learning so far and my reading so far is not about technology of future, but it is about mythology of the past as well. Uh, what we uh, always think is uh, uh, what we are witnessing is something new. Uh, but it is not so. In fact, uh, the same questions uh, that we have, uh, uh, that we are trying to articulate now, have been evolved uh, in different phases and in different contexts, even in the past as well. Uh, say, for example, if you want to understand uh, compliance, basically, people talk about norms. So, if you want to understand about norms, you need to go a little further past and try to see how humanity has for first evolved. So what has happened when humanity tried to convert itself into societies? And if you want to understand how humanity has evolved, you need to go back uh, again uh, to the evolution of the universe itself. So how universe has initially started and what actually led to the uh, development of humanity. Our span of existence on this planet is very minuscule and it is within this span we now invented humanity, we now invented societies, we now invented norms. So the point is when we are talking about technology, we tend to behave that as if like this is the world we live in, but this is not the world, this is the world of last 200 years. The world is basically the 13.8 billion years which we have crossed so far. So if somebody needs to understand what is going to happen to technology in future, but what they need to do is to look back beyond these 50 years that we are proud of and then try to see how these norms originally got evolved. Then you will find most answers. And that's the reason I mentioned that uh, when somebody talks about technology and future, the only answer we need to say is that it's not about future. You need to see what made an evolution possible so far, which will make or break the evolution of future as well. My immediate reaction to hearing that is, do most compliance people think like you? <laughs> Uh, not really. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is an interesting angle. You do link a lot of your thoughts you know, when it comes to everyday, and you call it mundane compliance. You link it to your cultural history. Uh, but what I think uh, uh, has helped uh, uh, by my stay in China uh, is to know that uh, these things are not uh, unique to any country as such. So what uh, uh, I have uh, heard in India, we call it as Dvaita. Dvaita is basically the dualism. Uh, it is not necessarily that we are one. Uh, it could be like a replica of uh, several things. So it is like uh, me and uh, the other person, uh, me and the God. So that Dvaita as a dualism theory uh, exists in uh, very importantly in our cultural uh, writings or our uh, uh, scriptures. And uh, in Chinese, in fact, I can keep hearing from a couple of our other friends when I talked about this, uh, they also say that in Chinese Confucianism uh, or maybe in a Chinese culture, uh, there is this concept of yin and yang, uh, which is basically again the concept of dualism. Uh, so uh, yes, compliance is little mundane. Compliance can be made interesting to several things in life. Uh, the biggest learning that I had in China here is that it is not necessary that it is your culture or my culture. If you go back into history, then we try to understand that we are one or we are together at some stage and our beliefs would have evolved at about the same time in different maybe cultural or a country context. Yeah, especially when you see it in terms that you said, which is it's not going to be about one culture versus another culture. It's going to be about a person versus a machine. And in that case... When you're comparing a machine, then all of us humans are the same, right? It doesn't matter about what kind of culture we come from. The more your interaction with machines is going to start, the more your understanding of yourself comes in. Uh, so I say this journey for me is from artificial intelligence, from AI to who am I? Uh, 
so the ai if somebody is going to embark on the journey he will end up ultimately to the question of who am i so then if you understand yourself as human then you understand what is the other distinct entity called as machine i think that is the uh, seed of thought uh, which has sparked here uh, especially in this country because uh, there is lot of interaction with machines lot of interaction with technology and suddenly you'll get a doubt as to are we going to be like uh, uh, machines are going to take our human beings then the fundamental question is uh, but do you know what is being human and if you understand that you'll understand all the things that we have spoken about just now how we have created institutions how we have created norms how we have created compliance uh, then you will have a fascinating journey into the machine world so then you will be equipped to understand how machines might behave because this is going to be the history repeating itself for future right well thank you so much sydney i mean that's a fascinating topic i mean you've you've taken it from compliance to norms to technology to ethics to like what it actually means to be a human I didn't expect to cover this with somebody who had a title compliance officer <laughs> but I um I really appreciate that and thanks so much for for sharing some of your views with us. Let us move on to part 2. Thank you. <laughs> I'm excited to do that. <laughs> <laughs> What is your favorite China related fact? This is some question people keep asking me when they come to China and they say that hey can you write my name in Chinese? Uh, I think that is the most uh, interesting fact I always try to tell uh, a visitor who comes to China. You can't write your name in Chinese at all. Uh, like what we do in other languages is we talk about alphabets. Uh, but Chinese don't work on alphabets. Chinese uh, works on characters. So if I say, for example, Srini, uh, there is no way in which you can write Srini in Chinese. It is like mathematics. So for mathematics how can you write a srini in mathematics so i keep asking the question to people saying that can you write srini in mathematics no because you have got nine characters which can represent the entire mathematics and in those nine characters you can't create a combination called a srini and that's the most uh, i i think uh, for me is an eye opener and uh, uh, shutting down my chinese classes <laughs> 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 do you have a favorite word or phrase in chinese i don't know whether you have heard that word it's uh, duang okay d u a n g duang uh, it's actually in 2015 jacky chan uh, when he was uh, doing a kind of an interview uh, for some shampoo ad it seems uh, he simply said uh, that my hair after applying this uh, shampoo is look like duang uh, and he said <laughs> that word has rocked the entire internet uh, uh, viral and there were like 8 million vivo hits that have occurred because there is no word called as duang and everybody started now using that word saying that uh, did you duang this uh, oh this is uh, duang interesting and uh, uh, the influence of this word has been so immense that they have created a new character to say what a duang actually is <laughs> it's a very funny story that i heard and uh, i uh, tell it as a kind of a favorite word duang <laughs> <laughs> what's your favorite destination within china now i would always recommend to people uh, to definitely visit the three gorges dam or the three gorges dam as you pronounce it uh, that is a phenomenally infrastructurally technologically and engineering marvel that one should watch when he has been in uh, china so alongside the dam you created uh, a kind of an, a ship lock system uh, but when i saw literally the water getting poured the door getting closed and the water getting poured inside and the ship literally comes lifts uh, gets lifted up and then moves on to the second stage third stage fourth stage the three hour journey is like a journey of lifetime when you are getting transferred from this side of the dam to the other side of the dam very good if you left china what would you miss the most and what would you miss the least i would miss the least is basically my passion for uh, watching uh, movies uh, mostly the telugu movies and before coming here to china in uh, 2017 in 2016 in india we have a book my show app where you book your movie tickets and uh, i i got an email in january 2017 congratulating me for the number of tickets i purchased which was around 120 tickets for the year <laughs> so uh, that is completely frozen for me so uh, i think i'm going to enjoy that when i go back uh, that's the first thing and the second thing is uh, if i wa- have think about what i will miss uh, is basically the walk to office <laughs> the most luxurious thing that you can have you can walk to office and go back to home by walk so i think that is what i might miss uh, if you have to work at any other place 
I think you do have a luxurious situation, even for China standards. Like, not many people walk to work in China. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that still surprises you about life in China? No, I think the only thing that surprises me is the precision. Uh, there are a lot of things I had an apprehension about uh, our country, like uh, India to some extent. Uh, uh, when we were taught in our childhood that one of the reasons for the, uh, the slow pace of the development in India could be the population. And with population, there are problems of coordination, there are problems of uh, policy formulation, and there are issues in terms of implementation. So uh, we ascribe some of these uh, pitfalls to population. Uh, but coming here, uh, I really understood even with population, you can have a lot of uh, uh, coordination and there is a kind of method to madness and that too to a perfect precision. That fascinates me very much. Any single thing that you do, uh, there is a kind of an order and uh, that is what fascinates me about this uh, place. And do you think that could be translated back into India? To some extent, we started doing that because the enabler is being uh, uh, digital. So I think that there are pockets uh, where we have achieved that. And the only reason for me to be very bullish is about the technology. What is your favorite place to go to eat or drink or just hang out? So the best place to hang around uh, is always the bun. And once you go the, and take a walk in the evening, I think you really can't stop admiring the other side, how it has been created. And uh, the phenomenal fact is that it has been done in the past 20 years. Yeah. What is your favorite WeChat sticker? The WeChat sticker is a cute little girl and uh, she ex gives a kind of uh, a weird expression like a oops kind of a thing. Uh, <laughs> and that is the most needed in a kind of a messaging platform, especially uh, when you do those silly mistakes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually one of my favorites, too. Is it? <laughs> yeah, she has such a unique way of contorting her face. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite song to sing at KTV? I think uh, people will ban me if I go to KT and start singing. So don't venture into that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you sing at all? Like when you're whistling down the street or... No, when I started, in fact, I didn't do much karaoke, but I happened to do uh, a karaoke in, uh, uh, I think, a couple of months before. And people started uh, thinking that the machine got corrupt because they said that uh, when we started doing the karaoke, I think um, a few weeks before, it was working fine. And when I started singing, they say that why this voice is not getting picked up and they all got surprised uh, as to why this is happening. Then I, they understood that it is not a problem with the machine. So they let the individual go out of that room. <laughs> I'm trying to link this back to what you said before about machines harassing people. Har and Hi, maybe people it, is a, <laughs> it is people <laughs> harassing machines. <laughs> the final question. What other China-related media or sources of information do you rely on? So basically, if you have WeChat, you have broadly everything. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, mostly I think I'm a little weak in terms of tracking uh, the local news. But uh, uh, things of my interest, you will always have uh, WeChat groups. Uh, you have got the uh, different groups of communities as such. So I think uh, the messages get uh, floating around. Yeah, you're not the first person to say that. Um, it's how we all work here in China, right? Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sidney. It's again a pleasure to have you here. I have one final request, and that is for you to tell me, out of everyone who you know in China, who should I interview next? So I have got uh, one of our uh, vice presidents, Mr. Leslie Masdrup. Uh, he, uh, I found him to be a kind of a person who could uh, actually have some of the insights that you're looking forward to, especially about the country, uh, about the background of a person and how uh, drastic differences you can see uh, a person can undergo over a period of time in terms of the positions that he gets into. So I think uh, it would be uh, my uh, privilege to introduce him uh, to you. Thank you so much. I really look forward to meeting Leslie. Fantastic. And I wish you all the best. And uh, thank you so much. So the images from today's chat are all on social media. There is Srini and his object, the apple, and the three ways in which the apple describes the development of mankind. 
The Latin phrase which describes Swinney's habit of talking in threes is omne trium perfectum. I've posted a graphic about that too, just in case you also didn't know how to spell it. <laughs> Apart from that, there is his favourite WeChat sticker, the little girl with the whoops expression. To me, she's saying more than just whoops, but I can't exactly put into words the full extent of the emotions that she's displaying. To see what I'm talking about, as always, check out Mosaic of China on Instagram and Facebook, or add me on my WeChat ID, Oscar10877, and I'll add you to the group there. What else? Um, there's images of the BRICS countries and the New Development Bank. And there's also a graph showing the population of China versus India. Um, there's also classic photos of the Shanghai Bund, the place that Sweeney mentioned as his favorite place to hang out in China. Uh, there are photos from the lock alongside the Three Gorges Dam. And of course, there is the character for Duang, the word which was totally made up by Jackie Chan. I researched this and it was from way back in 2015. So please let me know if this is something you're still either using or hearing in China in 2019. Mosaic of China is me, Oscar Fuchs. Extra editing support from Milo de Prieto. Artwork by Danny Newell and China support from Alston Gong. I will see you next week. Music